This year marks the 70th anniversary for the founding of the Piaolin Navy. As China's engagement with the world gets deeper and broader, we need to take a second look at the mandate and the mission of the Piaolin Navy. Today we come to Qingdao, home to the North Sea Fleet and host place for the celebrations of the Navy's 70th birthday. At this defining moment, please join me in reviewing the history of the Navy and the process of the military build-up. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Quietly docked at the wharf of China's Naval Museum is the number 105 vessel of the Piaolin Navy, the first destroyer developed and manufactured by China and named the Jinan. To start our discussion today, we got on board this historic warship. I'm very delighted to be joined here by Major General Xu Hui from the Piaolin National Defense University, right next to me, and Mr. Zhang Junshe, senior captain from the Naval Research Academy of the Piaolin Forces, here on board the first destroyer of the Piaolin Naval Force, uh, homemade, by the way, by the PRC in the 1970s. Welcome to our discussion here, gentlemen. First of all, why was Qingdao chosen as a location for commemorating the 70th founding anniversary of the Piaolin Naval Force? As you know, we have up to now successively five naval parade held in China. Four of them are held in Qingdao. You know, one reason that the headquarters of the North Fleet and the local government have very rich experience in organizing such a kind of, you know, big event. And also the, the waters here are relatively peaceful than in South China Sea or other areas. The naval base normally you know, they, they open to the world, and the majority of the coming, the port call visit from other countries are coming to this port. A lot of even held here. So for the international fellows, they are quite familiar with the circumstances and the conditions of these spaces. So it's uh, convenient for them to come. Is this a very popular uh, military port for overseas militaries, particularly navies, to have their port calls here over the past decades? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, Qingdao Naval Base is very, f um, uh, is well known to uh, almost all the navies in the world. May, uh, I think this is, this, is, this was the first uh, naval base open to uh, to, to the foreign uh, navies, uh, and this is the first uh, naval base open uh, to other countries. And then we open our. Uh, naval bases to Shanghai, uh, in Shanghai, Zhangjiang, uh, to other navies. So I think, uh, just as uh, General Xu says, that, that uh, the, the reason we choose uh, Qingdao as the location to hold these uh, celebrations, uh, most of uh, the, all the, the main reason is that we are, the people here are very familiar with such kind of uh, activities and they are very experienced uh, with this uh, kind of activities. Well, one, one very important reason I would like to add is that the, the Navy base here is not only the headquarters of the North Fleet, it also witnessed the development history of our Navy. A lot of, you know, first uh, arms within the naval service or came into service from this place. For instance, the first destroyer flotilla based here, and the first uh, naval aviation schools, the first submarine schools, and also the first search and rescue dis uh, fl uh, flotilla, all are, you know, established here. And so it's a glorious history of our naval development. This year is very special for at least two reasons. One is, of course, the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, which was founded in 1949, and the other the 70th anniversary of the Navy, the Piaolin Navy. Therefore, many international observers uh, would be very concerned with the implications of having a blue water Navy under construction by the PLA armed forces. But what blue water Navy could be an important part uh, for the observation. Can you brief them on uh, the future of having the Chinese blue water Navy? Well, uh, first I want to say that currently the Chinese Navy is not a blue water Navy. 
uh, from the history of the development of the Chinese Navy, we can see uh, the Chinese Pier Navy has actually uh, been going through three periods of uh, history. First, I think, is the uh, period of uh, coastal defense uh, period. Uh, uh, from the <coughs> beginning of the founding of the People's Republic of China and also the founding of the Pierre Navy in 1949 and to about in the 1980s. That is uh, the, uh, the period of the coastal defense. Uh, most of the sh warships of the Pierre A Navy that time were small gunboats, uh, small ships. And after the 1980s, mid 1980s, uh, we enter the the phase or the period of offshore defense, and many or uh, many big ships uh, such as uh, destroyers and frigates entered service. And uh, in the new century, from the beginning of the new century, uh, we enter the period of uh, offshore defense and also far sea protection. Uh, we in this period we uh, we have built some. Uh, big ships like the guided missile destroyers and also uh, the first and second aircraft carriers. And in this uh, uh, period, uh, main task is first is to protect uh, the motherland and then protect the, our overseas interests and the sea routes and sea shipping routes uh, that we rely on. Uh, we are trying uh, all to enter the stage of the Blue Water Navy, but now we h I don't think we have arrived at that stage. But do you think the construction of two <coughs> aircraft carriers, one, the first was of course based on uh, a training uh, carrier that we imported somehow from Ukraine. Um, many ask the question as to what's the purpose of having the Chinese uh, aircraft carrier strike groups? Well, uh, currently we have one aircraft carrier in service. That's the Leonin uh, aircraft carrier. It is mainly used uh, for uh, test, uh, experiment, and training. Uh, from this uh, aircraft carrier, we can get some uh, experience of using aircraft carriers and training uh, the aircraft carrier pilots, uh, the carrier-based uh, fighter uh, jet pilots, and. Now, uh, our f actually, the second aircraft carrier, the first homemade aircraft carrier, has been launched, and it will enter service uh, in the future. Now, it is conducting sea trials uh, now. Uh, just uh, as you mentioned, the purpose of China to acquire aircraft carriers, I think, is to better defend our modern land, and, and second, uh, to better defend our national interests, especially our uh, de uh, development uh, interests and also our overseas interests. I think as uh, uh, rising uh, as a big country in the process of rejuvenization, today's China's interest is reached to all the corners of the world and our people also you know, traveling around the world. So we terribly need a Blue Water Navy to protect our national interest throughout the world. Are you suggesting um, actually uh, that we are quickly transforming uh -huh. from a continental power to a maritime power because we are after all the biggest trading power. Maritime stakes need to be protected. I think you're absolutely right. We need to, pr to protect our people and our interest. At the same time, with the increasing capacity of uh, the second largest economy, also as one of the P5s, so we are highly expected by the international community. What I mean by international community is the members of the UN. Most of them have higher and higher expectations for Chinese military to, pr pr you know, to play a more contribute, uh, constructive role in maintaining peace, especially in global commerce in terms of the Navy. But in which way are we doing that? We will not follow the gunboat policy in history to invade or intervene the other countries. Even to protect our own national interests abroad, we should work together with our partners in a cooperative ways. So if you want to cooperate with the other stakeholders, you should have your capabilities. The Blue Water Navy, I think, 
is really a right choice, but it will be developed step by step according to our you know, national strategy. When did we actually start the process of transformation? Uh, transformation from a continental power to one that combines the both continental and maritime power? Well, I think uh, the period of the coastal defense may be uh, roughly ended in the mid-1980s. We know that uh, our former commander of the Pierre Navy, uh, Admiral Liu Huating, uh, put forward the naval strategy of uh, offshore defense in the mid-1980s. Uh, that, uh, is that because China has a long coastline? Yeah, this is the first reason. Uh, we, 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 then this explains the reason why we develop our aircraft carriers. First, is for uh, national defense. Uh, because uh, we know during the modern history of China, between 1980 and between 1840 to 1949, when the uh, People's Republic of China was founded, uh, during these uh, 100 years, China was invaded by Western countries, including Japan, from the sea for more than 470 times. So I think uh, the reason we strengthen our n maritime defenses and naval capability is to defend our country from such kind of invasions uh, from the sea. This is the first reason. Second, I think, is because uh, the extension of our national interests, our overseas interests, we have to defend uh, in this, including the shipping rules, the, s the safety of the shipping rules. And also, we have people all over the world, and we have to defend, to protect them. Third, I think, is just as the development of our country, and the international society put forward the demand for China to carry out more international uh, obligations and duties, such as the uh, escort and counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden and the waters of Somalia. So I think this is why we strengthen our naval force. And what do you think of the impact of the uh, air defense identification zone uh, on the periphery of China? Uh, some of the neighboring countries show their concern. It, it is a, it's a common practice of the, a lot of countries in the world. Even you know, in the coastal areas in China, Japan, South Korea, and even uh, other countries, they declare their ADIZ. Uh, it, it is not an area for a sovereignty. It is to give you a more space for early warnings, to prevent misunderstanding, miscalculations, to maintain peace, and make you more readiness to prevent possible invasions, I think. It's a common practice now. And even if you establish that kind of zone, doesn't mean you will simply you know, shoot any planes or ships coming to their zones. You can have different measures and different steps to, you know, to make sure you know, the coming flights or the defense side will be ready to communicate. L let me go back to uh, the modernization of the Chinese uh, Navy. The Western scholars have been talking about the so-called area denial strategy of the Chinese armed forces. The United States is concerned that it, it has a lot to do with the future of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, their concerns? Well, uh, the A2AD, anti-access and area denial, this uh, norm or this phrase uh, was invented by the Western countries. Uh, I think the first was invented by uh, the RAND Corporation in the United States, and then was adopted by the U.S. military. But I, to be uh, honest, the Chinese military never used such a phrase in their uh, the terminology in our military dictionary or in our active use. Uh, the A2ED means that China will block other countries, including the United States, to use uh, uh, the coastal area, the maritime area near China. Uh, but this is not true. China just strengthen our maritime defenses uh, al along our coast. This is for uh, defense, not to <coughs> expel other countries or drive away other countries from this area. So uh, I don't think the A2AD is a strategy or a tactics uh, of the Chinese military. Uh, we never use such, such a terminology. This is invented by the Western countries, Western scholars. With the rapid development of national defense strategy, Major General Xu, it's urgent to cultivate the talents 
who are proficient in advanced equipment. What measures do uh, National Defense University of PLA and Naval Research Academy adopt to train the top echelon of military talents with global vision? It's a very good question. When we're talking about the military modernization, people pay more attention on hardware, you know, like warships, airplanes, tanks, whatever. But as we say, the f this final say was given, you know, the, the capability of a military, the determining element is man. It's not weapon itself. Human it's resources. the people yeah, who hold the guns. So that how to train the talented people, how to develop, you know, to, to cultivate the commanders from joint operations to keep pace with the time is a very important task for PLA education and training. Within this round of reform, I think you noticed from headquarters, from four structures, and also now we are undergoing the third stage of reform is very important. It's policy of personnel and uh, logistics, you know. So within that, this round of reform, one of the focus is education. After restructuring of the education system, you know, uh, especially within in, in the highest level of education, like National Defense University, we redesign our curriculum, redesign the program for training senior officers, and give them more chances to expose themselves to the international stage. And even in our college now, we almost have a full coverage of the world, which for those countries have diplomatic relations. They have dispatched their senior officers to our college. So we have a nickname called Mini United Nations in Military. And in that stage, we have more and more Chinese senior officers coming to the class to be trained and together and discussions, uh, held discussions, seminars together with our international fellows. I think this is a very good chance for share their, you know, world views and believing systems and their way of thinking and shared experience of dealing with a variety of threats for our common interest. I think that's a very positive development. Thank you very much. Do appreciate it. Yeah. A rapid military build-up has led to the PLA expanding its overseas presence and has also caused concern to some other nations. But is the growing Chinese Navy actually a threat regionally or even globally on the dock of the Jinan? We continued our discussion with the senior captain Zhang Junxie. Welcome back to the follow-up discussion with the senior captain Zhang Junxie. Well, uh, Mr. Philip Davidson, the commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, said the PLA is the principal threat to the U.S. and not the interest. Uh, he might have implied the message that uh, our PLA Navy is able to break the so-called three island chains. What do you make of his concerns? Well, I think his remarks remind me of the uh, Cold War era because we know that the concept of the island chain was invented by the U.S politicians in the 1950s, it was used to contain China and the former uh, Soviet Union. And uh, from his remarks, uh, we can see that he doesn't take a correct and rational attitude toward the Chinese military development. We often say that uh, we should judge a country uh, from his, uh, its strategy and also its national defense policy. Uh, to judge whether this country poses a threat to other countries. Uh, China takes uh, the national defense policy. Uh but, but do you think uh, the construction of our military facilities in the South China Sea means automatically we're, that we are able to advance our forward military presence uh, from uh, coastal defense uh, to the uh, open ocean, I mean the deep ocean, Will it endanger the so-called freedom of navigation? I don't think uh, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is a problem because we have never seen any country, any uh, merchant ship uh, uh, complaining about uh, any problem uh, concerning freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. I think uh, the freedom of navigation has been an excuse of the, uh, for the United States to meddle in the South China Sea issue. Uh, and also the island uh, construction activities uh, conducted by the Chinese 
uh, side on some uh, islands and reefs in the South China Sea are mainly uh, used for civilian purpose. Senior Captain, we, earlier we were talking about the issue of constructing the Jeepty naval support base and our Indian friends show their grave concern about their national security. Does it mean that we are able to project our power and pose a direct threat to uh, South Asia? I don't think so. Uh, the construction and the use of the Djibouti uh, support base uh, is mainly uh, to help China uh, better carry out our international responsibilities and duties such as the escort and anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden and the waters of Somalia. And this will help China uh, better fulfill such kind of uh, missions. And do you think uh, the flotilla that patrols the Somali waters would also, in emergency cases, uh, evacuate the Chinese nationals from countries like Libya that took place in uh, 2011? Well, uh, I think so. We can see that the flotillas of the Chinese Navy operating uh, in the waters of Somalia to conduct escort and anti-piracy uh, operations will use the Djibouti support base uh, for the rest of their sailors and also uh, for the support uh, of provision of the vegetables and oils. So I think this is a very good uh, naval uh, support base Actually, this, this occurs uh, with the international practice. Uh, many countries, including the United States, France, and Japan, uh, have set up their uh, naval base in Djibouti. So I think uh, this is also normal to China. We have a larger presence of Chinese nationals in Africa. Do you think, uh, let me go back to the issue of uh, evacuation. In emergency case, do you think Djibouti would be used uh, as an uh, important uh, uh, place to evacuate our Yes. Chinese nationals. Yes, just as uh, we have done uh, in Yemen uh, several years ago, our warships can evacu evacuate our citizens uh, in this area and also will help us uh, to better fulfill the peacekeeping missions. During the Ming Dynasty, China was a maritime superpower. However, since then, the decline of the Navy and the fate of this country have been closely associated. To have a more detailed look at that part of Chinese history, I came to the Qingdao World War I Relics Museum. Up next, I'm very happy to be joined here by Mr. Yang Laiqing, an expert of uh, National Archive Studies in Qingdao City. We're going to review history of the First World War and its impact upon Qingdao. Welcome to our discussion here, Mr. Yang. From Ming Chao的鄭和下西洋的商船就不具有任何的軍事入侵或戰領的目的,到了 呃,一八九四年甲午战争爆发,这一段我们这个北洋水师的成立和我们的航海的历史相结合,能不能跟我简单的介绍一下中国的海军成立的早期? 第二次鸦片战争以后开始建立的，当时是英法联军攻陷了北京，火烧了圆明园，对清朝啊以强烈的冲击。从那开始，清朝开始酝酿建立近代的海军。我们十年之内建立了北洋水师，但为什么那么快
和日本一个国家的海军在那作作战，这是它的第二个原因。第三个原因呢，就是我们在使用北洋水师之后，它的战略是错误的。啊，我们的海军呢是一个非常保守的这么一个海上的一个战略，主要目的是什么呢？主要目的是为了威吓，是希望有一支强大的海军阻止日本，而不是主动去寻敌兼战。所以很多的战争，海上的战争基本上都是被动的。挨打的是处于这么一个状况。今天我们的海军现代化呢是如日中天，我们的硬件建设非常蓬勃发展。呃，外界对中国的蓝水海军的建设，整个军队的现代化建设有很多的猜忌。看今天的海军建设，回顾历史，能不能给我们分享一下您的感悟？就是一八九七年开始呢，遭受德国的这方面一些侵略，德国人是从海上来的。一九一四年的时候呢，是日本又发的发动了日德战争，它也是从海上来的。所以说，在旧中国，我们的海军是，我们是没有强大的海军，没有办法抵御外敌的入侵。所以说，我们在这个青岛这个地方来纪念我们海军建设七十周年，就有特别的这方面的一些历史意义。也就是说，相当时间内，中国的武装力量是局限在陆地，是陆军。只有多次遭到外敌从海上入侵之后，我们才意识到要萌生一个建设强大海军的这样的想法。这从清末这个北洋水师这个角度讲，它确确实实是一个当时是在这个十九世纪这个七八十年代是由海由海防和塞防之争的，就是我们国家的战略究竟是在陆地上防御，还是在海这个防御，或者不同的战略方向的防御，这方面是有争论的。但是当时主要的帝国主义的侵略方向是从海上来的。包括第一次鸦片战争、第二次鸦片战争、中法战争、日本入侵台湾等等，都是海防的。所以当时清廷这个呃开始萌发了建设近代海军啊这么一个思想啊。但是呢，由于当时的历史条件啊，他这条路子啊是没有走得通的。主要原因在哪？刚才已经呃已经已经提到了这个原因，就他解放军的思路是错的，他的机制这方面是错的。Recent history has proved it again and again: a giant cannot rise without a strong navy. China is not an exception. Peaceful waters require peaceful intentions, but also the power to protect.